Hello and welcome. This webinar is titled Pelvic Floor Rehabilitation for Post Prostatectomy Incontinence Part 2. And today's guest speaker is Bill Landry, registered physiotherapist from the Family Physiotherapy Center of London. Please note that this topic will be covered as part of a three part series. And without further ado, I will now turn this webinar over to Bill. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. So today I'm going to talk about the male urinary system before and after and about the pelvic floor muscles. So the outline today, we're going to talk about the anatomy and the physiology of the male urinary system before and after radical prostatectomy. I want to talk about the different types of incontinence and I want to talk about your pelvic floor muscles in much more detail. So let's talk about how the whole system worked before the surgery. So before the surgery, there were four main mechanisms that all worked together to prevent leakage. The first was a stable detrusor function or muscle. Now what that means is that's your bladder and around the bladder there is a detrusor muscle. This muscle is smooth muscle tissue, meaning you do not have direct control over that muscle. It is used by the brain. You can't actively squeeze it or relax it, but it's all in the system that works when you need to go to the washroom. When you're going to the washroom, you're urinating. It is squeezing to try to get everything out. When you're not going to the washroom, it is not squeezing. It is actually relaxed. The second thing is the internal urinary sphincter, so located right here. And what that is, that's muscle tissue that wraps around the urethra which is the tube where all the urine comes out. And basically when you're not going to the washroom, that sphincter and that muscle tissue is squeezing to prevent any leakage from coming out. It is also smooth muscle tissue. So you don't have direct control of that. You can't tighten it or relax it. It's an automatic function. The third thing, the upper third of the urethra, so the upper third of the tube is also lined by smooth muscle tissue and basically when you're not going to the washroom this entire tube here is sort of tightening down on itself it makes it difficult to get liquid out the fourth mechanism and the main one that we're going to be talking about is the external urinary sphincter or the rhabdo sphincter and your pelvic floor muscles this you do have control over and here we have several types of muscle fibers that we have control over okay now, what happens after the surgery? So after the surgery, your urologist would have came and he would have cut just above the pelvic floor and he would have cut the urethra and then he would have cut just below the bladder and the prostate and he would have removed the prostate. Once the prostate was removed, he would have grabbed what's known as the urethral stump. So there'll be a little bit of the urethra that's left above the pelvic floor. He would have grabbed that brought it back to the bladder and re-sutured everything. At that point, the catheter would have gone in and stayed there for two weeks, approximately, sometimes more, sometimes less, um, to allow the incision site to heal. And then the catheter would be removed and you'd be good to go. The difference is that you would have lost the internal urinary sphincter and you would have lost also the lining and the uh, smooth muscle tissue within the urethra, within the prostate. And so what you're left with is you're left with the external urinary sphincter, your pelvic floor muscles, and a little, you'll have a little bit of smooth muscle tissue still left in the urethra to help regain continence. But the point is you don't have as many mechanisms as you did before. So what has to happen? The, the muscle tissue that you have left has to compensate for what you've lost. So for example, if your pelvic floor muscles and the external urinary sphincter before the surgery were tightened up to 20%, let's say, to prevent leakage from coming out, now you'd have to tighten up to 30% because the mechanisms above aren't there. So this is something that has to be learned. Not only do you have to build up strength, but you also have to learn to hold that. And the good thing is, is that your body and these muscles are designed to do that. So let's talk about the physiology, sorry, physiology of the rhabdosphincter. So the striated muscle fibers of the rhabdosphincter enclose the urethra ventrally and laterally. 
basically what we're saying is you have muscle tissue that you have control over that is encircling the tube where the urine comes out and this muscle fiber tissue consists of both slow twitch muscle fibers and fast twitch muscle fibers. Now what does that mean? Slow twitch muscle fibers are ones that are designed to be on a little bit and they'll be on all day for you. Fast twitch muscle fibers are designed for power. These are the ones that we're kind of used to when we lift weights and we're trying to strengthen our biceps. That's mainly fast twitch. It's all about strength and power. We have a lot of power. We can hold that, but only for a small amount of time. They fatigue quickly. This muscle consists of both. And they found that 66% of all the muscle tissue within your pelvic floor and the rhabdo sphincter consists of this slow twitch type 1 fibers and 33% consist of the fast twitch type 2 fibers. So it consists of both. And because of that, when we as physiotherapists want to work on strengthening these types of different muscles, we give you different types of exercises to do this. And they also found that the rhabdo sphincter and the pelvic floor is capable of maintaining tone or tightening over a long period of time without fatigue, which is really what it has to do. It has to be on the entire day or for two hours to not let out any leak and it leakage and then when you go to the washroom it relaxes and lets everything out but for most of the time this muscle has to be on it's not only on for 10 seconds now what types of incontinence uh, are seen after radical prostatectomy so the most common and I would say 100% um, have this at some point is the involuntary urinary leakage on effort or exertion, sneezing, coughing. So the stress incontinence. And what that is, is basically when there's pressure pushing through the system, because you don't have as many uh, mechanisms to prevent leakage, you tend to leak a little more when you have pressure pushing, when you're getting up, when you're coughing, you're sneezing. So that is very common. Another form of leakage is urge incontinence. So that's when you have involuntary leakage, you have to go to the washroom really badly and you can't get there in time. This, what's happening here is your bladder and your detrusor muscle, muscle are squeezing and activating before you want them to and it's increasing the pressure and that's what's causing the leakage. And that occurs a lot less. And usually after radical prostatectomy it's a combination of both if there is any urge incontinence and that's called mixed incontinence. So that's when you have stress incontinence and you also have the urge incontinence. A very rare situation is when you have overflow incontinence. And that's when there's a, an obstruction, a blockage in the urethra at the bladder neck. And what's happening is the bladder is filling up and it can't get the urine out. It can get a little bit out, but it can't get enough and your bladder is always full. And that puts increased pressure. And eventually you start to get leakage that comes out. You'll find in this scenario, you always feel full. You feel like you're dribbling a lot. You can't get a good flow coming out. You might feel like it's uh, you're urinating out of a straw and it just doesn't flow out. That could be a, a case where there's a, an obstruction. You would want to go back and talk to your surgeon if you have any of those uh, situations for overflow. We're going to mainly talk about uh, the situations th that you would do with stress incontinence and urge incontinence. So let's talk about the pelvic floor muscles in more detail. Um, a correct pelvic floor muscle contraction has been described as an inward lift and a squeeze around the urethra with a resultant urethral closure, stabilization, and resistance to downward movement. So that means a lot. What does that mean? Um, what does that really mean? And I'll get into detail on that on the next page for men. Now, they found, they did some studies with women because there's not a lot of studies for men um, after with incontinence, but they have found that 25% of a maximal pelvic floor contraction in healthy women significantly elevates the bladder neck. They found that a maximal pelvic floor contraction, so tightening as hard as you can, does not further elevate... Uh, sorry. Um, does not further elevate the bladder neck after 50% of effort in the pelvic floor of healthy women. There is a considerable increase in intra-abdominal pressure with maximal pelvic floor contraction. So basically, if you're contracting as hard as you can, you can be, and most guys are, also activating their tummy muscles, holding their breath, and that's actually increasing the pressure and causing them to leak more. 
Um, so both the pelvic floor muscles and the external urinary sphincter consist of two major types. As I said, there's this type 1 and type 2. Uh, the majority of the fibers are the slow twitch composition. Um, physiologically, these muscles of the pelvic floor are different from other muscles in your body in that they are basically designed to be on the entire day. I give an example uh, that I like to give my patients. It's like the muscles in the back of your neck. So these muscles are designed to be on all day to hold your 20 pound head up. If those muscles aren't on, your 20 pound head is gonna fall forward, but you don't have to think about it. You could contract your, pelvis, your uh, neck muscles as hard as you can and move your neck, but the reality is your brain tightens them up a little bit to keep your eyes horizontal, and it does that all day for you. You don't have to think about it. It's not like, oh, I forgot and your head falls forward. They're designed to be on the entire day, and it's the same thing with your pelvic floor muscles. So how do I know, or how do you know, if you're performing a proper pelvic floor muscle contraction, or a Kegel? The easiest way I have found to teach a person or a man to contract their external urinary sphincter and their pelvic floor muscles is to ask him to contract his penis. So. Most guys will understand what this means. You want to tighten your penis. You should feel the tightening at your penis followed by your scrotum, your perineum, which is the area between your scrotum and your anus, and then finally your anus. But it's really all about tightening your penis. And the reality is the less you tighten, the more effective it is at regaining continence. And that's the big takeaway phrase I want to send to everyone. The less you contract, the more effective it is at regaining continence because this is something you have to do all day. Now, seven out of 10 men who come through my door are not doing the Kegels correctly. Most are activating their abdominals, they're doing too much, they're trying too hard, they're activating their buttocks, they're holding their breath, and they're actually causing more leakage. Again, I'm gonna reiterate, less is more. The less you contract, the more functional and effective it will be at regaining continence. You should be able to do a pelvic floor contraction, have a conversation with someone, and they should never, ever know you're doing this contraction. This is much more effective at regaining continence. So what's next? In webinar three, I'm gonna discuss in more detail several exercises that have been recommended specifically for men after having radical prostatectomy and urinary incontinence. I'm going to show you some examples using real-time ultrasound of how the pelvic floor is moving as I use it as a BioP feedback for patients in teaching them how to correctly activate their pelvic floor. And they can really see when they tighten just a little bit how effective it is at increasing their tone in their pelvic floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. And at this time, I would like to remind our viewers that if you're looking for further information regarding prostate cancer care, please visit our website where you can download and order our various health education resources. There are also resources attached to this webinar. And if you're interested in viewing more webinars, please visit www.prostatecancer.ca slash expert angle. Once again, thank you so much, Bill, and that concludes our webinar today, and thank you everyone for joining us.